Okay. Ladies, thank you so much for taking time to, to talk with me today. We're going to have an interesting conversation that's going to help um, our women because we there's a lot of things that, that goes on as far as minority businesses are concerned. And I'm going to tell you that um, for me, the, just even putting on this event as a businesswoman was one of the hardest things that could have ever happened to me. I don't know about you guys, but... Um, I've had to deal with a lot of interesting things because I was black, not because I was just um, a woman, but because I was a black woman trying to do something interesting in Pensacola. And so um, I wanted to do this workshop specifically because I know that, that I'm not the only one that's, that's struggling as a black woman trying to figure out how to do things in business. And because of that, I didn't. Um, I wanted to, to reach out to different areas of the country. And so we've got Maya Harris, who is in Virginia. And then we also have Bridget Jones, who is in Washington, DC. And I also have with me, Miss um, Sabina Saguza. Saguzi? Yeah, Saguzi. Um, and she's not from here. She's originally from Africa. Is that correct? Many years ago. Many, many years ago. <laughs> and then we have um, Marnie Alicia, who is a Pensacolian, a native of Pensacola. And then myself, Catrice Johnson, I'm originally from Connecticut. So I wanted to, to get some, some, some thoughts and some concerns, of some, some ideas on paper. And so I wanted to ask you guys some questions, and we're just going to have a real deep dive discussion. The first question that I sent to you ladies is, um, what is your definition of success for a black woman in the context of the future business, as a future business owner? So Maya, why don't you go first? Uh, okay, well, first of all, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much, Catrice, for inviting me to be on this panel. And I didn't know you're from Connecticut. I'm from Connecticut, too. We got to talk about that after. <laughs> Originally. Um, so, you know, we I, I work with women of color every single day. You know, womb is literally, that's our name, women on minority businesses. And um, for as, as we're all kind of gearing towards you know, our goals and, and, and what, what that looks like for, you know, the, the members of our organization. Um, and we've had this discussion many times. Um, and, and sometimes we put a, a, a number on success. But for me, um, I, I feel like we will reach our pinnacle of success when we're able to get back in our, to our community and, and start to be able to employ within our community. Um, most black owned businesses are, are solopreneurs. We're, we're solo, solo entrepreneurs, right? Where we are the CEO, the COO, the CFO, and where we have all, you know, we're, we're taking care of everything in our business, but really when we're at a point where we can financially go back into our community and create jobs within our community, that's when the legacy starts to happen. That's when we're able to have that, um, that, that impact in our communities. And for me, that's, you know, and of course there's, there's a dollar, a dollar amount behind that. Um, and so we have to, we're, you know, we're, we're constantly talking about, it's not just, I need to make six figures. It's okay. If I'm making six figures, that means I can now work, help somebody else in, in their family. If I'm making seven figures, that means I can have a team and I can employ within my community. And so for, for, for me as a black business owner, my success is, is really um, hinged on my ability to uh, directly impact my community. Okay, so let me ask you this question then. Um, I'm gonna go with Marnie real quick. Marnie, what is what is the greatest assets in, um, in business for you as a black woman? Uh, I think the greatest asset is uh, valuing myself and my time in my business mm -hmm. and not stealing from myself. Um, that's, that's an asset as well as uh, having safe spaces for myself is an, is an asset. I believe that's an asset because I'm able to uh, produce however I want, create however I want, things like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
And so let me ask you, because I'm going to, I'm going to do a deep dive. Have any of you ever had the experience where um, you've come up against your white counterparts and they've called you a bully? Any of you? You don't have to be, you could be verbal. <laughs> not, not as an entrepreneur. Not as, I was a teacher for 20 years and, you know. I was the, the angry black woman in the building. So no matter what I did. So, but as an entrepreneur, I tend to surround myself with people that look like me. So I haven't really had to deal with uh, being a bully in my own as space. As far as um, um, dealing with clientele, have you had to deal with that at all? I think for me, it's not mm -hmm. much of a bully. It's too much of like I'm, um, I'm looking for privilege. Like because you're... You are, you are black, you, you, you know, you, you are putting yourself in the pedestal because you always, you know, there, there are all this forgiving stuff because you are black, you're a black woman. So I should feel sorry for you rather than I am, you know, we are in business together, whatever it is, I'll tell you what I'm doing, tell me what you're doing and we go on that platform. I'm not going to look for anything just because I'm black from you. So it's not it's not too much of a bullying. It's coming from the other side of saying, oh, I, you know, because you're black, you you feel like you know you've got all these privileges. So, you know, we are not at this on the same same platform. I don't know whether I'm being clear. Yeah, I understand what you're yeah. saying. For me, it's microaggressions when you come into my exactly. storefront um, with with white people or anyone who's not a POC. Um, and they come into the storefront and they challenge my authority or my uh, credit, or I have a white intern and everybody thinks she owns the place. All the white people think she owns it, <laughs> but I don't care. I let them think that. And so just so I can, when she turns and has to say, well, let me speak, let me ask Marnie, the owner. Then they're like, oh, you know, that type of thing because of what I do. I think um, those microaggressions like that um, are forms of bullying that I think come with privilege and and I don't I no longer think that they're not um, intentional or they're unaware. I think that they come intentionally to uh, places of color sometimes or businesses of color um, to just test the waters and see mm, what you got going on that kind of thing which hey it doesn't bother me. Um, but the, the little microaggressions asking me, well, where did you get your degree from in this and da, 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 that kind of stuff. Um, I don't find that I run into that as much uh, with my, in my community. Nobody ever asked me, where do you get your degree from? And da, da, da. they don't or, or where do you get your products from? I get that a lot um, from other, I should say, Caucasian business owners that might be do what I do. And they, well, where do you get your stuff from? And da, da, I, you know, you. That's a, I had to work yeah. for this, just like <laughs> yeah, so, so, right. Right. Well, for so. me, it's the story of my life because my ingredients are from Africa. So mm -hmm. everyone keeps saying, ah, so they're from Africa. Aren't they starving in Africa? Or why, <laughs> you know, are they safe because they're from Africa? I always tell them, you know, my products are safer than the ones you get here because I am under scrutiny from the FDA to bring product here. So, you know, those yeah. kind of little things that don't, you know, I mean, you would think somebody is sensitive enough to say those kind of things. I'm sure if I was a white person, they wouldn't ask that they wouldn't because ask they would think a white person is going to look after mm -hmm. us. It's, it's safe. I am black. So I just, you know, do yeah. anything. Yeah. Right. So I've had to deal with it um, a little bit myself. And um, I, I do I do I have three different businesses. Let me just say that um, the power link is one of them. But. One of the biggest businesses that I actually have is a graphic design and marketing business. And I would go and I would, um, most of my business comes from white women and white, you know, men. And, and I would tell them what I was capable of doing and how I could help them and grow their businesses and get everything up and running. And we would get started on their information. And then the next thing you know, they will be challenging me on everything. Well, well, I talked to another graphic designer and they said that you should do this. And it was like, well, if you want to do what they want you to do, that's fine. But I'm telling you, that's fine. Um, literally about three, three and a half, I'll say about two years ago, I had a young lady that I explained to her how the website should have been designed for her for a massage therapy. And she got so upset with me that she literally called me a bully. Like physically, you are a bully. And I was so hurt. I didn't tell her. I actually um, hung up the phone and I cried. 
So I stopped doing business with her. And then about a year later, after everything, I had taken all the pictures, did all the design work, everything, paid me for it. She took it down, did some weird crap on her stuff. A year later, everything that I told her that she needed on her website, she put back up on her website. But she needed to be told by a white person. And it was just like, wow, okay, no problem. So I, I asked that question because a lot of times we as um, women, we do, especially black women, we struggle with that. How do you overcome that situation? Like, what is it whenever, so for example, someone comes into your store and you see that microaggression or even a straight out aggression. I just let them be ignorant on their own. And then I also remind them that this, if I need to, that this is my space um, and you can leave. You know, for me, I have no problems putting up my boundaries. Um, I think that um, I've learned that being an entrepreneur for 17 years now, I've been working for myself. And that's one thing that you just have to learn is your boundaries, as well as that you, like the gentleman said earlier, you have a value um, or else they wouldn't be there. Someone values what you have. Um, and not only that, I'm a little, I think the service that I offer because I'm an herbalist is a little different. Either you want the medicine or you don't. And most of the time they get right. And be like, well, I wanna, I wanna try it. I know you do. <laughs> so, so Bridget, let right. me ask you a question. What are some of the challenges? Because you're in the tech world, which is a whole different avenue. What are some of the challenges that you have as a black woman being in the tech world? Well, what are some of the challenges? That is a bit of a convoluted and complex way type of question, right? So what how do I even begin to even answer that, right? So I could talk about the challenges as a as a woman, as a black person, um, managing male employees. I could talk about that. I could talk about uh, the challenges getting clients. I could talk about, you know, the levels of respect or the the constant having to show my purse when, you know, when I'm in, um, you know, having conferences or meetings. I'm really thinking, how long do I even begin approach answering this right so uh, let's start this way I'd, I'd say some of um all of the above right so microaggressions exist for us all over the place right it exists for us in in the language right so a lot of engineers happen to be uh men right happen to be a uh, brown men so oftentimes like you know when they they work for me i i experience a lot of challenges with them understanding who's the boss and who's running who's cutting check Right. <laughs> you know, so things where they may not necessarily communicate with me, but like I may have another male employee that they're, you know, they're they're openly sharing, you know, what's going on with projects, having to sort of be that B. Right. I, I don't like being that person. I really don't. Getting out of my element is something that makes me really uncomfortable. That is a challenge. Um, there is challenges with, um, you know, just with the race. Um, not um, so with not just from um, white people per se, but I want to say every type of person imaginable. You know, when they think about what a tech person looks like, they think it's like some sort of geeky, nerdy looking white boy with like freckles. They don't think of somebody like me, right? And so just the whole ideology, the archetype of what an engineer is, is something that I'm constantly having to overcome and then redefine, right? So those are some of the challenges. And also there are challenges with pay. Right. So um, unfortunately, I get it mostly from my own people. Right. Um, software is not cheap. There is no part of software that is cheap. Right. That's just what it is. And so a lot of times people will say, well, hey, you know what? Bridget is black. So I know she's going to give me a deal or a discount or I could get it for free. Right. But, you know, that same person may have a budget and they would never try a white person like that. So, you know, it's, it's real. <laughs> It happens. Um, it uh, it bothers me, but the reality of it is, is it's really just um, you know redirection and, and, and miss a lot of misinformation and miseducation, really. So you know when um, when we have more spaces like this, this this type of thing helps. Uh, Catrice, thank you for offering the power link. I think it's important that we do this a little bit more often so more people can, can hear from melanated people that are out here doing the work so they can see representation in this way. Uh, I think it's important. And I think that if we continue to do this and we're successful, then we can actually begin to re-educate the way that people think about the way um, uh, black women are out here running business. Exactly. Um, and what, so the power link to me, when I first got started with it, um, it was really designed specifically to give um, Black people a platform. Um, not I wanted to have it be all-inclusive, but 
when I used to go to different business events or expos or conferences, all you saw were um, the our white counterparts up on stage and giving all this beautiful information and it was great and it was working, but it was like, I know that there, I talk to people every single day that that's, that's black, that has melanin in their skin, that can give that same information, if not more impactful. And so it was really kind of interesting to me whenever I started putting this together, how um, it became a big deal to make sure that I had melanin on stage. Like, it's really yeah. important. I think, too, though, we have to give ourselves a little bit of compassion in the geogra geographical area that we're in. That's true. Um, the access to that type of information for a while, especially in this area, has been kept from us. Or we don't, we're disadvantaged with the schooling. Um, the gentleman yesterday, if you think about it, when he talked about having coming from Aragon Court, I remember Aragon Court. Um, and having to get out of there, you know, those projects, his mindset was like that. But a lot of times we have everything against us and it's just been over time. And we do need to break those glass ceilings. Like I would not have, I, I'm, I'm appreciative of this conversation. I feel like that, but this is a part of us breaking the ceiling is being able to have this conversation in the open in those places that for me, that's success where I can talk about my challenges openly in front of everyone like that for me is a part of success and i think like i understand how we did it like this but i think that that is still an issue for us we're having to still it's almost like we've been even trauma in business you know there's even trauma in the business when you don't have i'm telling i remember beginning when you first start out and you don't have no money and this is your only that is traumatic like i used to be like oh my god i'm taking a cold shower oh my god i'm taking a cold shower you know and then for a long time i that was my fear of the, I, I do not want to take cold showers. You know what I mean? Like I was that type of entrepreneur where I was all the way in, but that was one thing I was like, shoot, I, I'm rethinking my life here. And I think a lot of times um, for the African-American POCs, anybody, we've had that issue where we, we come from a disadvantaged part. So here, I understand that trying to get us together and talk about technical in this area, that's going to be more that's going to be more complex more difficult um and something else that we just have to keep pressing forward with because that's the only way we're going to do it is to uncondition that so maya let me ask you a question um how can we as black women um advocate in business so that we can get that that whole like for example what marnie just said you know there's a whole fear aspect and um like and I, and I have to, I'm guilty. I'm, I'm absolutely guilty. I literally was like, we're going to have this conversation in the back room because I have several um, white businesses that are here mm -hmm. and I did not want to offend them, but it was kind of yeah. like, I wanted, I, I really wish that some of them had actually taken the, the mm -hmm. workshop to see how we're feeling concerning certain things. And That's the thing. We're always worried about offending them and um, in the things that we do. And I think that goes back to creating safe spaces for us. And if we're together saying that this is happening and you still look at it and still do it, and that lets me know you have no type of compassion for my business. And that's not someone, you know, that, that I even have to care about with that. But that that's the thing that they, they, they should be able to hear. It. This is the reason why we're still screaming. I think Black Lives Matter because we're still having to have these private conversations in, in places like this. So, you know, I agree with you, Mani, mm -hmm. but there's also, I think, to take a step backwards just a little bit, I think just understanding where we are coming from before we wash our diapers in the open. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. what do we need to do as black women? What, what is it, you know, like you started the question, um, what is success for you? Why can't we support each other? I mean, those are things that we can talk about. You know, how, how do we support each other? How do we make sure that we're going from step one to step two? And then there's certain things that we need people to know. We need them to know, just like you're saying, in the open. But there are some of those things. I mean, I, I love this conversation that we are having today because there are some things we just need to talk about. You know, what is it that we can do for ourselves, for ourselves? How do we um, encourage another black business woman to say, you know, I'm with you, sister, let's 
let's go. I've got your hand with me. I'm here because I needed to support Catrice. Mm -hmm. I said I'm going to drive in that thunderstorm, but I'm <laughs> going to support her, and I'm coming. I'm coming here for an hour and a half. I'm going to drive because I needed to support you. You know, I mean, that's that's how that's how I feel about it. That there are certain things that we can talk about in the back, but yes, we need mm -hmm. to let people know where we are. So okay, so then the question becomes like. No, the, it's a two-part question. How, as we as Black people, as Black women especially, how do we support each other? Like, I, and, and I appreciate you coming. I really do. Can I answer this one? Yes, please. So I'm going to start by saying we are already supporting each other, all right? So to think that Black women at any time in history didn't support other Black women is just not true. Sometimes it means that we need to talk to each other and say, sis, what are you already currently doing to support another Black person and how can I support you, right? So no, 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 no. We do. We support each other, like... In healthcare, we support each other at home, in the community. We raise and, we've been raising babies. Like, we've been supporting each other. Like, all over the, the, the world. The world. I, I'm, I'm glad Bridget said that because we, we have been given, well, the world has been given the impression that we don't support each other. Okay. Black women are hands down. Down, yeah, yeah. the most supportive. Group. <laughs> if if you need somebody to have your back, I promise you, there's a group of sisters behind you doing what you know. We everybody got that circle, right? We have our friends that fill those certain roles. I got I got the sister I call when I need prayer. I got the sister that I call when I just need to get you know get my frustrations out. I got the sister that I call that when we need to take off earrings. You know what I'm saying? We are we are we are naturally supportive, and that that didn't come from you know just thin air. We learned that from our mothers and our aunties and our grandmothers. But the world actively tries to give the impression that black women are always fighting black women are catty black women don't support each other you're not going to see sisters on you know, on the television screen that are you know taking care of each other who, who are we going to see we're going to see the real housewives we're going to see the basketball wives fight each other because that's the narrative that the world wants you to believe Right. But that's never been my experience. Ever. And, you know, it, outside of like little high school stuff or whatever, you know, but that's for all women. That's stuff that all women have to deal with. But black women, when it's when when it's time to get something done, have mm -hmm. always been supportive of, of each other. What we need to do as sisters is to make sure the narrative that's being pushed to the outside world is what we actually experience. And so you know i'm 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 going to support you you know the like, catrice and i wouldn't catrice don't know me from a can of paint we just we're professionally connected and she inboxed me i was like sis that sounds good what you need me to do right because i recognize that when you're on a on a stage where there are other people looking that we have to come forward and say, "Oh no, I, I support my sister. I'm gonna do. I'm. I'm going to do what she needs me to do because I know she's gonna help me out too." Um, so, Bridget, I'm glad you said that because we we definitely have to make sure we're controlling that, having more control over the narrative of what the world thinks is happening um, behind mm -hmm. the scenes. Because at the end of the day, in my experiences, if I needed something, it's always been. A black now, there woman. is something there is something about region that's significant to talk about right because black women do not support each other in the same way in the in different parts of the country i'm originally from south florida okay mm -hmm. so that support looked very different than what it looks like here in dc now we do quite a few things i will say this though like in business specifically when i need support i go to black girl ventures Right. So that's a it's like a it's a it's a it's a website where we go to we meet up and we do co-working every single Wednesday. And there is nothing it's like 600 black women all day from like nine to five supporting each other for free. Right. We share resources. We share how to get money. We share how to get grants. We share like how to how to build a team. There are there are a lot of us out here. Right. And I will say, though, like when I lived in South Florida, you know, years and years and years ago, not necessarily in South Florida now. 
but we were not openly talking about the things that we were doing, right? So I can I don't know what it's like to live in Pensacola or anything or what the the real culture is amongst the black people there. But listen, if you guys really want some support, shoot talk to us. <laughs> Me and Maya, we in this DMV area, we connected to a whole lot of resources and support. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> and, also, oh, yeah. I and I also think that it's 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 a principality. It's a communication issue. It's not a non-support. It's a it's a thought that's out there because even in the the love and hip hop, the things that we see online, they're still supporting each other in those shows. Like they're supporting Mona Scott for a check. They have, and, and I know this just because I've been on the other side of it in the other field that I used to do, but that's what, the, you know, they create this TV scenario and then behind the scenes, it's a uh, it's a whole nother ball game, and it's a and even though it's a a distorted look at support because really it's some of it is feeding into the things that we've been conditioned to think that black women can't get along. Behind the scenes, these women are supporting each other business wise. They're still sharing this show. They're still doing all those things. That's a form of support that just it just it looks different, you know. But it's still support because all of that funnels down back into a black girl's pocket. Yeah. You know, and back back out into those black girls' pockets. So I, I do see like there is a you know, and that goes back to communication. I think that's the difference here, is that we don't communicate as much here. It's not that we don't support each other, but like you said, an open communication about who's doing what and who's doing what. Mm -hmm. I realize I'm sharing my stuff all the time on social media, um, in our groups like that are local to black, you know. And I realize that I don't see as much of the share, and so I'm wondering, is it a fear of what they're putting out there, if they're doing it right, you know, those types of things. And then not having that, like they say, that Wednesday full of 600 where you can, you know, that kind of thing. We we have to get let go of the mindset that um, there's not enough when actually it's enough for everyone. And I've been guilty of that too, especially when you first start now, you're like, oh, I gotta get mine, oh my God. What do you do? Well, it's, you said, you said it earlier, it's having that, that safe space. You know, so Black Girl Ventures in DC, which I didn't even know about, Bridget. I need to get with you after this. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> that's only that's only a ninety minute ride for me. Um, but you know, having this ha having that space where um, we can come together, and sometimes it it takes that sister's like, okay, you know what? I'm creating this space, and y'all just y'all show up, and we, we'll figure it out. Um, you know, that's what we're doing here in Richmond. And you're starting to see that um, just it's the, these spaces for sisters, Chicago, L.A., Dallas. And, you know, I'll have folks inbox me like, hey, Maya, we're trying to do something similar to what you're doing here in, you know, Ontario. Like, all right, all right, Canada, let's let's work it out, you know. But it, we, it, it takes somebody to say, OK, we need to create this space um, because once the space is created, sisters show up. Um, and we're hungry for it. That black women, black women, if, and y'all already know the statistics. We're make we are starting businesses three times faster than any other subgroup. We're starting businesses faster than white men, white women, black men, Spanish, everybody. Sisters are leading the way with that. Um, so they're hungry for it. They're hungry for those resources. They're hungry for those connections. Um, and it's just a matter of getting over some of them, maybe the regional barriers or whatever the barriers that, that are external and some are internal. <laughs> um, some of those barriers that, that are, are in front of us, but the, they're looking for it. You know, they're looking for the it. Barriers because like, um, I'm, I'm hearing <clears throat> certain things, but for, I will tell you that for me, one of the barriers is whenever I do share, because I have a big vision. I, my, my goal is to take over the world. And um, <laughs> I, I peek in the brain. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but in, in the process of doing that, I, there's been a lot of things that, that I've hooked and, and, and barriers that I've had to, to come over. What were some of the barriers that you as a business owner had to like, you know, try to get over to help you achieve where you were trying to go? Um, Access to money. Mine was in internal fear. Internal, internal, fear. internal fear of success or losing. For, for me, I had... Um, How did y'all get over the biggest barrier in my opinion? I, I, I can't hear. Yeah. How did you get over your the biggest barrier, a biggest um, barrier um, in business, which is yourself? 
Mm. that support system that that sisterhood behind yeah. me i have yeah. i have a mentor and it's 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 the conversations you you surround yourself with um because i dealt with uh, imposter syndrome hardcore you know like i said i was a teacher and so who am i to go into this entrepreneur space and and talk about business and when, when my background is in education and i had a mentor you know who sat with me who's you know seven eight figure earner um, who put me in a room with other women who look like me, who were seven and eight figure earners who had to just help me get my mind right. And sometimes it's just, you know, having, having this, like, again, creating that space where sisters can come together and, and push each other and say, look, you no, you actually have, you know, what, what it takes to do this. And sometimes because our, I think our family sometimes push, you know, a certain agenda with education and you got to, you know, we have this whole thing that the, the, the box that we were supposed to fit in. Um, and that's not necessarily what, you know, our, our white counterparts were taught. And so you come into a space and I'm like, Oh, I, I got to get this certification. I got to go make, get back and get this degree on this. And, it, and then you have the white guy who had a D plus average and dropped out his sophomore year in college, who's making, multiple millions right and so sometimes we have to be in a space where say okay no sis this is what you need to do these don't Absolutely. worry about this right now that you you already have it let's get let's give you the foundation let's give you some you know these steps but it's you know to get over that mindset you gotta have Absolutely. different voices coming in to tell you that you have what you need Mm -hmm. So for so for me it was um putting practices in place right so I have a I have a prayer life. I pray constantly, you know, um, I, um, I also just like Maya surround myself with the support system. I want to say like to, to your question in the back, I can't really see you very clearly, but like the, um, the answer to, to that question for me was to first get information. Right. So, you know, that there's a saying like, um, education is, is paramount. Knowledge is power is real. Right. So when you understand a little bit more about the way people do things, the way things work, you're in a more powerful position to, to assert yourself and to be able to rule and lead, right? So I'll give you a good example. Engineers in South Florida make $40,000 a year. Engineering interns in Maryland start off at $90,000 a year. Simply knowing that, <laughs> Allow, put me in a position to make better decisions for my life, literally knowing it, right? And then um, there is a thing, right? So before COVID, getting access to information was extremely difficult in business, right? So it was, it was hidden behind paywalls, $400 an hour consulting fees. Because we are in a pandemic, because we are in a global crisis, What's happening right now is people have dropped those barriers. You can now reach out directly to Google and speak to people for free. Okay, that just this just happened, right? Clavio, Clavio is a is a tech company. They released a, a list of thirteen hundred individuals willing to share their time for free. Thirteen hundred of some of the most powerful people in the United States. I will happily share the list with you, right? Be open about what you're going through because I can almost guarantee you there is a black woman that has a solution for it, right? Yep. Talk about it for real, openly. Yeah, yep. absolutely. And I just want to mention also the fact that you know after, during and after the pandemic, there's been a lot of resources online. So even if we are here in this area where we don't have too many uh, resources. You know, to go to, um, I'm online all the time. I belong to so many groups of women of color, like you just saying, Bridget, I mean, I'm online all the time and I ask them, I mean, so what do I do? Or what, and, and it's not, it's not the distance. It's not, a, it's, it's just that support system that I need, you know, within my business. So uh, just like uh, you also mentioned, I've got a group of women, uh, black women, we've been meeting for three years online. We've never met but we oh, wow. support each other. Like every month we are there, come rain, come sunshine. And you talk about what was your problem last month? How did you solve it? How can I help you? Those are our questions. Wow. And it has been so helpful because we're coming from the same lane. 
you know, you, you, you know you are coming from a disadvantaged and how can I help you? I've got friends who are in Boston, in Washington, D.C., in California, and, and we meet every month. Uh, so that has been very helpful um, for me. And then I just wanted to mention the fact that I've, I've, been, I've been in business for 16 years, and I have always been in, a, in an area where I've sold to white people. And I, can, I know exactly what they're thinking, what they're going to say next, and I just say it because I need my business to go. To answer your question, for me, whatever negativity comes towards me, I take it as a learning experience. I never let it get me down. Then whatever you said, I'm going to go and find a way of saying it back to you so that I, I go further on with my business. Just the other day was my first ever time to be selling to a very group, big group of black people. I'd never been with African American audience like that big. And I felt so at home because they were like, we want to support you. I don't care what you're selling, I'm gonna buy it. <laughs> <laughs> I need that kind of positivity. But it was so great because I never had that, that love for what I sell. Because I'm busy in having to, I sell products that I hard to explain. So I have to explain and explain it, though I know what they're gonna say. But these folks, they didn't care how I'm explaining it. It's like, I'm gonna support you, sis. I don't care what you're selling. So, so we do have that support system online, offline. We got the support system. I think we all know that we need to support each other. Um, and I work with women in Africa, and it's, it's the same thing. Same thing, I mean, they, you know, just that support is unspoken. We just know that we are there together. Yeah. I wanna say like, um, I use the law of attraction, and I, I was introduced to that by a mentor. Um, and I actually, when I first started with business, I looked at people, I'm a reader, um, and I looked at people who I thought were successful and I admired. Mm -hmm. And then I started looking for a theme that was with all of them. And literally, it all started from within um, themselves. It wasn't a, what was on the outside. It was they created a practice or a routine for themselves. They practiced solitude to get their minds together in the mornings. Those, those are the things I incorporated. And then um, I realized the same intelligence that created the universe is the same intelligence that created me and lives inside of me. So for me, getting over me, because I was very afraid, uh, ancient, am I gonna make it? You know, I couldn't tell my mother I had a business because she was in the military for 20 something years and you don't never work for yourself. You work for someone else because it's safe and you can, you know, it's safe, you're a black girl, you're a black woman, a kid, it's safe. You know, but for me, that wasn't something, I knew that wasn't the way I wanted to play, it was safe. I, I couldn't play safe. I wasn't happy in that environment, per se. Her life wasn't what I wanted to live. Not that I didn't love her, you know, so for me, uh, that was the first step, finding people that look like, and then seeing what that running theme was, and then realizing that um, it doesn't matter what I do, it's about the will that I put into it. And so some days, um, like yesterday, I worked a 14 hour day. I realized, didn't nobody cut my check but me. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I worked all 14 hours of yesterday for myself. I'm gonna work it again today, later on, and it felt good. So you have to know what you value first. And don't separate, I think you can't separate, as black women, this is not in our DNA, to separate our belief, our faith from our businesses. Um, and I see that a lot of people, some people do that or they try to. Um, and I did that in the beginning and I felt like that wasn't as successful because even that part of me, I believe in three parts of self, is my business. Like it's not, I'm not just running a business, I am a business. So I became what I wanted to be not using, you know, I know, not so, I know sometimes we get wrapped up in the imposter syndrome, but when I say I became that, I looked at the themes that they practiced, which was a lot of it was just discipline and believing in themselves. And even if they didn't feel like they believed in themselves, they wrote it down. Every single one of those people I studied had a journal and a pen that they kept with them. And that was the one thing that I took with me. And now I do the same thing. And that has been, I made my first, um, six figures, like selling plants, 
Like <laughs> a few, uh, like last year when I do my taxes, I was like, "Shit, I'm in a whole nother tax bracket." <laughs> now I'm looking for discounts. I'm like, "Huh? Who can I? Who can I? They gonna come get me?" And then I agree with you on knowing that stuff because it made me look at business different. When they said they were coming to get thirty seven percent of what I made, I was like, "Dang!" Wow. Like that, right? And so that put a whole nother perspective for me. Like you, you probably already made your six figures. You just don't know if you don't look at the numbers. Right. And um, I think that I used to be afraid of that. Look, look at the numbers. numbers. So that's the thing that I would have to say that got me was doing the thing that I was afraid to do anyway. Just do it anyway. Your ancestors gonna so, hold you up. Uh, and I'm gonna mm -hmm. tell you, like I've been, in, I've been doing graphic design and marketing for about 20 years. Mm -hmm. Literally started in 2001. And I started because I was looking for a job in Pensacola. I'm one of the first people to graduate from Pensacola um, State College at the time. And when I graduated, I went looking for a job and every person told me you'd be bored with the job or you were overqualified or what have you. So I went into business from that moment mm -hmm. on. And um, I'll tell you, I lived in here for 20 years. <laughs> Like to really, I knew that I had a gift. I knew that I was able to to really get in people's heads and really do what they asked me to do as far as you know graphic design was concerned. But I was always afraid of failure. Yes. And then I was afraid of success. And it was blowing mm -hmm. my mind. How I was afraid of both of them at the same time. <laughs> and it was like, wait a minute. And so when I started doing the power link, I started getting a little bit more confidence, but I'm gonna tell you, my confidence kicked in last year. Mm -hmm. When the pandemic hit, it was almost like, it was a whole <laughs> different side of who I was as a woman. Mm -hmm. It was like, nope, I'm gonna sit down and think this whole thing through because I promised myself when I turned 50, I was gonna be a millionaire and I'm not, and I was mad. And it was like no, but that's not true because you probably already had a million dollars once over. People, we we made a million. You made more than a million dollars in your lifetime. <laughs> so, yeah. I want to be able to see yeah. it and keep it. That's my thing. Okay, <laughs> so um, I began to sit down and think about my life as a whole and try to figure out what it was I wanted to do. And every person that. I told my dream to black or white. They were like, "That's going to be a hard thing to accomplish." You can't and tell everybody your dream. I learned that too. Yeah. I can't tell everybody your dream. And so the thing that got me was um, a couple of months ago, my brother contacted me because he's doing really well. He's making six figures right now, mm -hmm. and he's like, "You know, you need to get into my business because you chose the wrong." Thing. <laughs> And I was mad. I was like, "How dare you tell me I chose the wrong field? Mm -hmm. I'm doing what I love." And I had to have a real heart to heart with him and be like, no, this is where God has me. Mm -hmm. This is where I'm supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And I'm okay with where I'm supposed mm -hmm. to be. But ever since I made peace with myself, money has been coming in. Like, I don't mm -hmm. know what I've been able to sustain. And the fear is just gone. And it's yeah. like, oh my God, I can be successful. Because money so, is the easiest thing to demonstrate. People, absolutely. People, that's like in the in the in the word it talks but about the it. biggest success easy. is having people believe in me yeah like that's been the biggest, biggest biggest success to have people say you know what i see what you're doing it's off the chain because you started believing in yourself exactly mm -hmm. and that's the, and so mm -hmm. i would say one of the biggest ways for it and i'm gonna end it on this note one of the biggest ways that we can overcome some of the barriers is literally taking time to see that we have self-worth like you guys said and believing in what we can do mm -hmm. price your stuff right, girl. Price it right. That's all my issue. Pricing my stuff. <laughs> I don't know if this is too much. Yeah, oh my god. Much, yes. Yeah. Because yeah. to, yeah. to you, it's priceless. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's your extension of who you are. And I learned that's like the first step when you know that you are doing better is when you can put a price and be okay with that price. With, you know, where you not you can feed yourself, keep some extra in your pocket, and service somebody else. I feel like okay. <laughs> You made it. <laughs> Ladies, this was a wonderful conversation. Yes, We're definitely going to do it again. I am so thankful that all of you, and no, I don't know any of you as like, a, you know, as a, from a can of paint. But I feel like you're my sisters, and I appreciate all of you for just coming in and just sharing your heart because a lot of times it's hard to get people to just share their heart. And you did just that for me today. Yeah. So thank, thank you guys. You. We'll thank have you for the invite.
Thank you. <laughs> have a wonderful day, guys, and I look forward to, to communicating with you again. And nice Maya, meeting you. Have another nice day. meeting you. So Maybe you. we'll see y'all in the group. Oh, Venture, yeah. what is it? <laughs> Vent, Black Girl Ventures. Black Girl Ventures. <laughs> I already went to their Facebook page. I gotta find it. <laughs> <laughs>